Welcome to Frazier and Dieter's Culture of Compliance podcast series, where we discuss compliance as a competitive advantage in today's marketplace. I'm Sabrina Serafin, partner and national leader of Frazier and Dieter's Process Risk and Governance Practice. Today, we're excited to talk to Scott Edwards, Chief Executive Officer and one of the founders of Summit 7, a leader in security and compliance with Microsoft Cloud Services. Scott has a fascinating background. Uh, After graduating from West Point, he started his career in the United States Army, followed by a stint as the NASA Data Center Chief Engineer. Through his leadership, Summit 7 Systems has been recognized by Microsoft with the 2020 U.S. Partner Award for Security and Compliance, received the CMMC RPO accreditation in 2021, more on that in a moment, and gained the trust of hundreds of Department of Defense suppliers as contracts. And today we're talking about those federal contracts and how organizations become qualified to serve the federal government. Scott, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Uh, it's really great to be here. I'm looking forward to uh, talking through this you know, very interesting and uh, sometimes complex topic uh, that is, uh, has been out there for a, a couple of years now, but uh, there's lots of questions out there, and, I, and I'm very happy to be here speaking with you about it. Right. You mentioned a couple of years. It's only been a couple of years. I breezed through it in your introduction, but today's topic is the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, or CMMC. Um, For the benefit of our listeners who are not familiar with CMMC, can you explain what what it is? Sure. So CMMC is the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. And this is a, um, a process that is being put in place by the Department of Defense Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment uh, that really focuses on the cybersecurity posture of the, the DOD supply chain. What happened in 2016 is that um, the DOD released, uh, if you're familiar with the DFARS, the Defense, the Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement, um, there was a, a clause released in 2016 uh, called DFARS 252.204-7012 that specifically put in place cybersecurity requirements for DOD suppliers that handled what was called what is called controlled unclassified information. And this started rolling out in uh, in 2017, and there was a deadline of December of 2017 for all of the suppliers to be quote unquote compliant with this DFARS 7012 requirement. Well, what happened was the the inspector general uh, for the Department of Defense went out and started auditing or assessing uh, DOD supply chain members and found out that essentially nobody was following it correctly. Um, they, they, They thought they were compliant, but they were nowhere close. And because of this, they wanted to move away from this self-assessment standard, which is what it was under DFARS, to a third-party assessment, uh, which is what CMMC is. And that's where CMMC got its start. It was essentially the failure of the DFARS 7012 clause led to the implementation of this CMMC requirement. I understand CMMC details different levels of certification. Specifically, we've had many discussions of level one versus level three Can you explain the significance of the levels? There's five levels of CMMC, uh, level one through level five, level one being the lowest, level five being the highest. And the majority of companies in the um, defense supply chain are going to be either level one or level three. Um, That's where the majority of companies are going to land. And there's there's different kinds of data in the DOD suppliers work with. You have what's called federal contract information or FCI. And then you have controlled unclassified information or CUI. And then there are subcategories of CUI, things like export controlled information like ITAR and EAR and other types of, uh, of data that, that fit into me in, inside CUI. And so if you are a company that deals only with this FCI content or this federal contract information, which is not public information, but does not meet the threshold for controlled unclassified information, then those kind of companies are going to typically be uh, what's called CMMC level one. And CMMC level one is a baseline, basic cybersecurity uh, level. There's 17 practices that you have to have in place. And all of these 17 practices are based on what was initially called the FAR 15 practices or the Federal Acquisition Regulation 15 practices that were put in place back in 2015. So they're, they're really basic cybersecurity um, you know, requirements. They're not super difficult to meet. Um, they're not going to be super expensive for you to meet, um, but it puts some basic things in like change your password, 
like make sure that you have uh, you don't you don't have group accounts, that kind of stuff. Very basic things. When we step up to level three, though, that's where things get get really dicey for a lot of companies. Um, and, and the reason is, is because um, it, it's it's a level of, of cybersecurity that many DOD suppliers have not been meeting um, up to this point. And it and level three is based on the requirement uh, that was in DFAR 7012 to meet a standard called NIST 800 And so NIST 800 was a list of 110 cybersecurity uh, controls uh, that had to be in place to meet DFARs. And then CMMC added to that an additional 20 controls. So we have a total of 130 practices plus maturity level processes and policies that have to be put in place for you to be able to meet CMMC level three. And so that is a significant lift from either CMMC level one or from not having a CMMC certification at all. And then when we get into level four and level five, those are more advanced uh, cybersecurity postures. Those are those kind of postures are typically meant to deal with things like advanced persistent threats and other kinds of, you know, more advanced uh, uh, attacks that happen against DoD supply chain members. But you're not going to find the majority of companies are going to have to do that level, either level four or level five, unless they are working in a highly technical, uh, borderline classified, you know, uh, weapon system program, like say maybe a hypersonics or missile defense or something like that or you know, maybe the F-35, you know, some of these you know, really high-end uh, programs that have unclassified content, but yes, it's unclassified, but it still would be very damaging if that information got out and, you know, if China was able to get access to that information. You know, for example, you see, you know, you look at all of, uh, you know, China's new weapon systems, they basically are carbon copies of the United States weapon systems because all they've done is stolen all the plans and then built it themselves, right? And so what we're trying to do is protect that from happening from both Russia, China, Iran, all of our all the bad actors out there, our, our adversaries, we're trying to protect the DOD supply chain by by ensuring that they have some basic cybersecurity measures in place to stop this from happening. Thank you, Scott. What type of organizations need to comply with CMMC Level Three, and are there trends that you find in areas that present the biggest challenges for these organizations? Sure, that's a great question. So. What we see is that, uh, well, first of all, any company that is going to be dealing with controlled and classified information is going to have to be at least CMMC level three or higher, right? Um, because CMMC level three is the, is the lowest level at which you can deal with controlled and classified information. So if you have that kind of content, then you know, you, you know that CMMC level three is going to be your baseline. So what types of companies are these that deal with controlled and classified information? That's kind of the follow-on question, right? Um, well, these are going to be uh, companies, uh, many manufacturers, uh, because anytime you're talking about building a, a bolt or an airframe or you know, uh, the electronics for the inside of a weapon system or anything like that, you're going to have designs and specifications um, that are going to be a target for adversaries to get access to, right? And so um, that content, if it's not classified, it's going to be controlled and classified information, potentially even export controlled information. And so companies that are dealing with that kind of information are going to have to meet CMMC level three or higher. So, um, and, and when you think about controlled and classified information, we're not just talking about the actual you know, drawing or specification, it could simply be a part number, like literally a part number can be considered controlled and classified information. So if you think about everywhere that part numbers may exist of this type of, uh, you know, these types of materials, then, you know, that's in a lot of different systems and a lot of different companies have access to that kind of information. And so it gets very broad very quickly. So the DOD has estimated that there's about 300,000 DOD supply chain members in, you know, out there. Um, of those 300,000, the DOD has estimated that about 60,000 of them are going to be CMMC level three. And so my expectation is that I believe that the number of CMMC level three companies is actually going to be higher than that. And the reason is because CUI content finds its way to places that it might not necessarily should be. Content gets flowed down to providers or DoD supply chain members that aren't necessarily, don't necessarily have a reason to have that content. Or they don't have to have the content. And so you know, there's a couple of things that you have to do here as a, as a DoD supply chain member. You have to be very careful about who you flow content to. Don't flow CUI content. Don't flow export control content as part of a contract to a, to a subcontractor that doesn't have a need to have that information. Um, that will 
save them from having to be CMMC level three. They might be able to be CMMC level one instead, which is going to you know allow them to be more efficient with the dollars. And you know their their pricing to you is going to likely be lower because they don't have to meet these higher level security requirements. Now, if the content has to be flowed, then you have to flow down the CMMC requirement to those <clears throat> to those suppliers. It has to go all the way down the chain. The requirement follows the information. It is a data centric requirement. So whoever has CUI. Anywhere in that chain, they're going to have to be CMMC level three or higher if they have CUI content. I understand there are some implications for Microsoft Office 365 or any cloud offering for the organization seeking CMMC and what they need to understand. Can, can you give us some insight into the issues there? Absolutely. Yeah. So Microsoft has been very... Um, you know, very forward thinking on the whole CMMC uh, requirement. Uh, you know, Microsoft built out uh, back in the mid teens a uh, US government sovereign cloud offering uh, that was meant specifically to handle things like export controlled information or ITAR information. And then as DFARS came out and as CMMC have come out, uh, they have continued to improve that platform to be able to handle controlled and classified information export controlled information, the DFAR 7012 requirements and, and those capabilities um, as, as the platform has grown, uh, which is great because you know there are not a lot of cloud platforms out there today that can really handle all of this content correctly. And so um, Microsoft built this US government sovereign cloud and you may hear it uh, referred to as uh, Office 365 GCC High and Azure Government. That's the platform that Microsoft built to handle uh, controlled and classified information and export controlled information. Now they have a separate environment that is really built on the commercial cloud that's called government, the government community cloud. Um, it was really built initially for state and local governments, um, but Microsoft has recently um, opened it up to be um, able to be used for controlled and classified information, but not export controlled information. So if you have controlled and classified information controlled and classified information, but not export controlled information, it may be possible for you to use the GCC platform um, instead of the GCC high platform. However, if you have export controlled information, the GCC high platform is the only place for you to really be with that content. So you have to really understand your data really well to be able to pick the right platform. Um, and these platforms, both of these platforms are undergirded by an infrastructure um, that has uh, been certified uh, FedRAMP certified at the FedRAMP high level. Okay, and this is another certification that is important when we start talking about cloud services. Uh, the government came out, started this FedRAMP program back in 2010, 2011 timeframe to essentially certify cloud services that can be used for government data. And so um, the DFARS clause that came out in 2016 basically specified that any cloud service that was going to be used uh, for government data, for controlled and classified information, had to be at least FedRAMP moderate, equivalent, or higher. And so Microsoft built these infrastructures, not just to FedRAMP moderate, but they built them to FedRAMP high, going above and beyond the requirement so they could ensure that they met the necessary needs. So Microsoft has been very forward thinking with these platforms to ensure that they're able to handle and support both the DIB supply chain as well as the federal government directly. Um, and, that's, and that's why they built these environments. Now, there are other providers out there that have cloud services that meet these requirements. Um, you know, one that comes to mind that most people think of or know of would be Amazon Web Services, their GovCloud platform. Very good platform. Uh, it has a, has a great following out there, great services and all of that. Um, the, the challenge with the AWS platform is they simply don't have a SaaS-based offering that does things like Exchange and SharePoint and OneDrive and Teams and those kind of capabilities, the kind of the back office, you know, core capabilities that, that people are looking for in, in, in email and those kinds of things. They don't really offer that. But if you're looking for an IaaS solution, an infrastructure as a service, sorry, instead of using the, uh, the, the terminology there, an infrastructure as a service uh, solution or a platform as a service solution, then Amazon GovCloud can provide that as well. Um, but you know, but Microsoft has built this kind of all-encompassing solution with the U.S. Sovereign Cloud that gives you the O365 capabilities and gives you the Azure IaaS uh, infrastructure as a service and platform as a service capabilities, which is really great. So I imagine we have a number of CISOs listening who, whose companies may be looking to grow by entering into an area that will cause them to handle controlled unclassified information or, or CUI. 
Uh, what advice do you have about the actions that these CISOs need to take to prepare to be certified? Sure. Yeah, it's a, it's actually a, a pretty long journey, to be honest. Um, most companies are not able to do this in a very short period of time. Um, it takes anywhere from, you know, I would say absolute minimal with all the necessary resources a year to do it. Um, and then most companies are taking, you know, 18 months to two years and sometimes even longer than that to get through everything that needs to be done. Um, you know, the first thing that you really need to think about, you know, if you've, if you've been under DFARS before um, and you've had those requirements levied on you and you just haven't finished that, then I would say the first thing you need to do is meet your DFARS obligations, the DFARS 712 obligations. If you're brand new to the DOD supply chain and you haven't had any of these requirements in the past, then you know, you're going to need to take an overarching look at your IT infrastructure. You're going to need to um, determine how you want to meet these services, these requirements. Are you going to um, try and build this in-house or are you going to leverage external third-party service providers to do this? Um, you're not going to be able to say, um, you know, give this as a additional duty to somebody you already have on staff and say, okay, go make this happen. It's not going to work. You just can't do it. You're going to have to have a dedicated staff uh, to, to, to focus on this, um, or you're going to have to bring in third party, you know, providers to come in and assist you with it. And you may end up having to do both um, because it is a lot. You have, um, you know, a lot of documentation that has to be built uh, about your infrastructure. You have to build out what are called system security plans. You have to build out um, policies, uh, an entire policy set that has to be built. You have to build out procedures on how, are you, how you do everything from a security standpoint uh, within, your, uh, within your IT infrastructure. Um, but you need to be careful and, and not think that this is an IT problem. This is not an IT problem. Don't hand this to your CIO and say, okay, CIO, go make this happen. This is a business problem. Uh, because it's business processes that are impacted. It's your, your ability for your business to pursue contracts are impacted. If you don't have this in place and you're not putting the appropriate um, you know, um, uh, leverage on this at the C level, um, then you're going to have challenges getting it uh, adopted through the organization. It's going to have to be something that has to be uh, uh, championed and pushed in the C-suite um, otherwise, uh, you're going to struggle for a long time trying to make it happen. The IT team cannot push this up the chain. Um, it's very, very difficult for the IT team to do that. This podcast specifically addresses compliance expense and really tries to communicate how compliance expenses can be truly an investment in a business. Mm -hmm. So from a budgeting perspective, what should companies be expecting or preparing for? as they determine whether this is an area that they want to either continue or enter into? Sure. So what I always tell everybody is that CMMC and DFARS is a six-figure problem. It doesn't matter if you're a five-person company or if you're a 500-person company. Um, it's at least a six-figure problem. You get larger than that, it becomes a seven-figure problem. Um, and, the, and the challenge is you're not just putting together some documentation and making some changes to some 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 IT infrastructure. In most cases, you're ripping and you're ripping and replacing the majority of your IT infrastructure as part of this effort. In many cases, uh, because uh, many companies are sitting on commercial infrastructure or infrastructure that is not Fed ramped, or they have um, on premises infrastructure that they don't want to deal with trying to bring up to spec. Um, all, you've got all of those requirements, and then you have the cost of the on-staff people that are going to have to help you through the process, and then the cost of the third-party people that are going to be helping you. And then you've got the ongoing costs. Um, so uh, the ongoing cost of supporting this environment long-term. And so once you put it in place, you have to support it. And it's not going to be the type of IT support that you've done in the past because there's a lot of ongoing requirements from a security standpoint that you have to do on a regular basis. You now have to have change control processes in place. You have to have risk management processes in place. All of these are part of the CMMC requirement. And so, you know, it is a significant investment. Now, I say investment. And the reason I say investment is because it can also benefit you on the backside of this. So if you get through this process, let's say you, you weren't a CMMC level three company before and you had not been doing these things, but you get in front of it and you, you, know, you get your CMMC level three certification done quickly, then 
you're going to be in a position where your competitors may not be there and they're not going to be eligible for contracts that are going to be awarded in 2022 and 2023 because they have not put the investment in to be able to be awarded contracts. Okay. And these contracts go anywhere from, you know, a $500,000 contract that, you know, maybe one or two people on a contract, or it may be, you know, a $10 billion contract, you know, and it's going to go everything in between, right? And so if you're wanting to pursue those contracts and you see the federal government as a growth area for you, then, you know, you need to be on the front end of this, make that investment so that you are eligible to capture this business as, as, as it is released. Um, that is a, uh, that is something that um, the C-suite is very interested in hearing because what your, your business capture teams really hate hearing is, oh, sorry, we can't pursue that contract. We're not CMMC level three yet. You start telling BD teams that they can't pursue contracts because you don't have a specific certification level. You're going to have some very unhappy BD teams and that CEO is going to be hearing about it really, really quickly. And so um, that is how I typically, you know, uh, present the problem to businesses. Scott, what have you seen or what do you expect to see in the marketplace as a result of CMMC being introduced? What we're going to see, and we're already starting to see some of this, is you're going to start seeing a lot of merger and acquisition going on in the industry. And the reason is because the super smalls are going to have challenges getting um, certified in many cases because of the cost, because of the focus required. And so you're going to see a lot of the super small companies start banding together to essentially spread the cost and the compliance challenges across you know, multiple companies by, uh, by, by merging together to form larger companies. And then you're going to see other companies just being acquired by large companies that have already been able to meet the requirements. So I think we're going to start seeing a lot of merger and acquisition um, activity in the DoD supply chain over the next couple of years due specifically to CMMC. This poses a real big challenge for the federal government as a whole, though, because the federal government as a whole is very focused on small business development. Right. You know, they're very big into making sure that you have 8A companies and women owned small companies and veteran, you know, uh, veteran owned companies and service disabled veteran owned companies and all of these different types of companies that typically smart is start as very, very small companies. One people, two people, three people. Well, how do these one person to three person companies get to a level where they can afford a CMMC L3 certification to be able to handle controlled and classified information? Many of them are going to challenge significant, you know, have a significant challenge with that. So they're going to only be able to do, you know, CMMC level one type activities for a period of time until they grow. And so that's why I think you're going to see a lot of merger and acquisition going on. And that's going to open up our opportunities for those companies that are able to get CMMC L3. If you make that investment, you may have the opportunity to acquire and grow through acquisition as well of some of those smaller companies that have specific capabilities that you're wanting to bring into your team. Scott. Thank you so much for being with us today and helping us understand more about CMMC. And to our audience, thank you for listening to Fraser and Dieter's Culture of Compliance podcast. And please join us for our next episode as we continue to discuss transforming compliance requirements into investments in your business. Thanks for listening to one of Fraser and Dieter's branded podcasts. To learn more, connect with us on LinkedIn or visit us at FraserDieter.com and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode.